Next up is George Harrell. Uh, he's going to be talking on a conservative rethinking of the French Revolution. This is part two. He gave part one at our last forum, so I'd encourage you to go check that out. But George Harrell is from Moscow, Idaho. He is a teacher with Kepler Education, where he teaches courses in American history as well as economics. So please welcome George. And this evening, as Jeremy pointed out, I'm carrying on my topic from the last conference, a conservative rethinking of the French Revolution. In that talk, that covered the uh, events of the 1789 revolution through to its conclusion in 1790. In that talk, my thesis was that contrary to popular opinion, the delegates of the Third Estate in 1789 did not set out with a revolutionary ideology to overthrow either the monarchy or the nobility. And that much of this popular narrative hinges on the assumption that because we've read Rousseau, we know what motivated the revolutionaries. But this claim stems more often than not from people mistakenly equating intellectual history with the history of intellectuals. So to quickly summarize some of that presentation, the political status quo that the revolutionaries have been accused of destroying, while it's known as the Ancien Regime, was actually a vestigial holdover that had survived the Louis XIV's program of monarchical centralization. He had kept the form of the nobility without its function, compensating them for their lack of political power with certain protected privileges. But in doing so, he also stripped away from them the social context for their existence. Louis XIV was able to make the centralized government work for him, but over the next 80 years, it became increasingly unmanageable. And by 1789, France was facing fiscal collapse, and the administrative system was unable to enforce laws across the provinces. And by this point, it was evident to everyone that France's political structure needed rebuilding. The revolution of 1789 then was thus a response to the collapse of the French political system, not its cause. And the delegates at the National Assembly after the revolution then drafted preliminary constitution. They replaced royal privilege with property as the basis for political participation and established a constitutionally limited monarchy. This was not driven by political abstractions, but out of a desire to conserve an order that reflected the real political structure of the nation. And by 1790, when Edmund Burke negatively wrote in his Reflections on the Revolution of France that the French Revolution was a digest of anarchy, France had successfully and almost completely peacefully transitioned from a near absolute monarchy to a constitutional one. Across France, there was a newfound sense of patriotism in support of the king and the National Assembly, and political figures in both Britain and America applauded the spirit of conservatism and comparative restraint that France had exhibited. And if we know the rest of the story, and we might claim as some people have, that surely Burke at least prophetically got it right, that the logical conclusion of the 1789 revolution was the violence of the terror. The revolutionaries were never going to be content and would always end up just demanding more and more liberty and rights until the revolution destroyed itself. But well, my argument tonight is that putting aside the ideological question, this determinism is an inaccurate method of examining history. And it specifically fails to consider the contingent circumstances that led up to the final overthrow of the monarchy in 1792. All right, so let's, let's examine this claim of inevitability and find out how a movement made up of devout monarchists found themselves to their own surprise tearing down the constitutional monarchy that they had created just two years earlier for a republic. By the summer of 1790, Louis XVI had publicly endorsed the National Assembly and had sworn to uphold the new government. The Constitutional Committee, meanwhile, was working on finalizing a constitution that would define the administrative system. But many of the, uh, many of the old economic and bureaucratic problems, they remained and still had to be dealt with. But two new ones had begun to emerge that were causing particular concern. The political unity of the nation was being fractured by the sudden appearance of partisan political clubs fiercely debating how the constitutional monarchy should be arranged, while a growing number of nobles upset at the new order were now boycotting participation in the National Assembly. And then thousands of these nobles, including the king's younger brother, not content to merely withdraw from political participation, began to leave the country for nearby Austria and Germany 
As they departed, they published pamphlets and newspapers all across France, appealing to Enlightenment ideals, denouncing the government as the product of a plot by Freemasons and Protestants, and urging for its destruction. As one pamphleteer wrote, one must have the courage to repeat the fact that France can only be regenerated through a bath of blood. And then added to this, the bulk of the French military officers were themselves nobles, and their departure from the country severely damaged the French military organization. And then these emigre nobles, now in Austria, began to form counter-revolutionary armies, intent on invading and restoring the absolute monarchy, while in France, they attempted to provoke numerous revolts and rebellions. And then although these were largely unsuccessful, the flight of the nobles, as it came to be called, caused a growing panic across the nation and an unending fear that nobles and their collaborators were plotting Bartholomew's Day-style massacres across the country. The emigre nobles began to pressure France's neighboring kingdoms for intervention, and in May of 1791, representatives of Austria, Switzerland, Sardinia, and Spain met and offered to go to war with France to reinstate Louis to his full powers. Louis, however, was playing a different game, and he rejected these proposals of foreign intervention. He had publicly sworn to support the new constitutional government, but at the insistence of his Austrian wife, Queen Marie Antoinette, he was working on a plan to try to escape from Paris and join the emigre army of nobles massing along the French border at Monmedy. Louis believed that if he returned to France at the head of General Bouilly's 10,000 French troops, and he would be warmly welcomed by the French populace. The National Assembly would then fold without a fight, and civil war would be averted. However, Louis was never a very thoughtful individual, and reports of his intended flight began to leak out. He was, he was widely revered and viewed across France in a very personal sense as the father of the nation, and the conservative delegates in the National Assembly, they angrily denounced the rumors of an Austrian conspiracy around the king as fake news. But as these reports became more numerous, even making it into the newspapers, um, there many people began to increasingly worry that the queen and the nobles close to Louis were plotting treason against the national good, and the National Guard watch on his residence in the Tuileries Palace was increased just in case the rumors were true. But despite these precautions, on the night of June 20th, the royal family, disguised as Russian nobility, managed to slip out of the palace and flee Paris in a carriage headed for the border. Louis, however, made himself quite conspicuous during the journey, chatting with locals, and was recognized by numerous people along the way when he stopped to repair the carriage. And finally, at the town of Varennes, just 30 miles short of his destination, the town council was alerted to the king's coming, and they were convinced to detain the royal family. A detachment of cavalry from Paris soon arrived, and he was escorted back under guard to Paris. And tens of thousands of Parisians lined the streets in stunned, Silence, watching the king dejectedly led back to the palace. The conservative delegates in the assembly initially attempted to claim that the king had been an unwilling victim of a kidnapping, but a letter was then discovered that Louis had left behind prior to his departure, intending to be read to the National Assembly, in which he repudiated his oaths to the Constitution and his public support for the Declaration of Rights and the National Assembly. And it cannot be overestimated just how much the king's attempted flight changed the course of French history. All the National Assembly's hard work over the past year trying to demonstrate a singleness of purpose between the king and the assembly to create a working constitution was dashed. The king lost all political influence across the country. Frenchmen expressed in their diaries and personal letters a deep sense of personal betrayal, that the king had lied under oath to them and had conspired to wage war against his own people and government. But not only had the king's flight damaged his own reputation, it had also discredited the conservative delegates who had for months been defending him. But the assembly was still left with the question of what to do with the king. They received numerous complaints from people claiming that a king who would perjure himself was unfit to rule, and for the first time, people in Paris wrote petitions arguing that France should simply do away with monarchs altogether and establish a republic. <laughs> 
The assembly, however, ultimately decided that they would proceed with the new constitution, and when it was completed, they would then present it to Louis with an option to swear an oath of allegiance to it and remain the king. And if he refused, then he would be forced to abdicate, and the monarchy would be set up as a regency until his young son was old enough to assume the throne. Now, when this decision was made public, it was generally accepted across France, but some denounced the move, and in Paris, tens of thousands of people believing that the National Assembly had sold out joined a public demonstration to sign a petition demanding a, quote, new organization of executive authority, unquote. The National Assembly believed that the demonstration was part of a Republican insurrection funded by either the emigre nobles or Austria to provoke a civil war, and the Assembly declared martial law. The Parisian National Guard was sent to confront the demonstrators at the Champ du Mars, but the panicky soldiers opened fire and a massacre ensued. Over the next two months, the National Assembly began shutting down the Republican clubs and arresting their members. The Republican movement was ended and order was restored. In September of 1791, Louis presented with the final constitution, which replaced the National Assembly with a new legislative assembly and grant the king executive power, including the power of veto. Louis accepted it and took the oath of allegiance to cries of long live the king. And Frenchmen everywhere hoped that finally this meant the end of the revolution. But internal and external divisions and threats remained ever present. The newly formed Legislative Assembly, although comprised of entirely new delegates, faced the exact same partisanship as the National Assembly had. But after the recent government violence, the partisanship took on a new sense of fear and demonization. There was no longer any suggestions of republicanism, but those on the right who dominated the Assembly continued to be terrified that the more liberal delegates were threatening to plunge the nation into anarchy, while the left, in turn, was horrified by the conservatives' willingness to suppress individual rights as they had during the period of martial law. And of course, both sides were worried that the other was riddled with individuals in the pay of either foreign governments or the emigre nobles. But then all their internal concerns were about to be pushed aside as the threat of foreign invasion reached a new height. In August, just a month before Louis swore to the constitution, his brother, as well as the Holy Roman Emperor and Leopold of Austria, who was Marie Antoinette's brother, and Frederick II of Prussia issued a joint declaration declaring a uh, threatening war on France if Louis was not reinstated to the full 1789 monarchy. Although Louis again publicly repudiated the declaration, many Frenchmen continued to worry that the Austrian conspiracy at the king's court was alive and well. And even Frenchmen who didn't subscribe to these fears, they found it grossly insulting to be dictated by foreign monarchs, and the declaration only increased a growing sense of French nationalism against the neighboring kingdoms. And in February of 1792, Austria and Prussia entered a defensive alliance against France. With the noble armies massing just outside the French border, it looked inevitable that France was finally going to be invaded. And meanwhile, Dutch and Belgian refugees from their recently failed rebellion against Austria convinced the Legislative Assembly that if France was to strike first, Holland and Belgium could be liberated from Austria and provide a defensive northern alliance. And such a quick victory could secure French sovereignty. And so the conservative delegates excitedly began pushing for war, believing that patriotism around a foreign conflict might end their political divisions. But it was the left-wing party, however, that denounced the move for war. Chief among these was Maximilien Robespierre, who, while not a delegate in the assembly, was a leading member in the Jacobin Club. And he gave several speeches, urging the assembly to not declare war, warning that such conflicts only lead to the rise of Caesars, Catalinas, or Cromwells. Quote, the most extravagant idea that can arise in a politician's head is to believe that it is enough for people to invade a foreign country to make it adopt its laws and their constitution. No one loves armed missionaries. The Declaration of the Rights of Man is not a lightning bolt that strikes every throne at the same time." Unquote. But the conservatives in power viciously condemned the anti-war Jacobin as pacifists and traitors. 
Meanwhile, the king was also pushing for war against Austria. The conservative delegates applauded his apparent patriotism, but Louis was gambling that war, regardless of its outcome, could only serve to enhance his position, either by making him a victorious leader of the pro-war faction or by leading to an Austrian victory, in which case his foreign relatives and the French nobles would reinstate him as the absolute monarch of France. The Austrian chancellor, in turn, issued a warning that a crusade of continental monarchies would crush France if they dared war. And in April, the emperor of Austria ordered his troops to mobilize on the French border. And then on April 20th, we made a public request to the, on the assembly floor that France should declare war against Austria. And in a fervor of patriotism and militarism, the assembly enthusiastically passed the declaration. The Austrian government excitedly heard the news of the declaration and believed that they would sweep away the French army, while the French believed that just as the Greeks had triumphed over the Persians, the French volunteer army would, would throw aside the slave soldiers of the despotic monarchy of Austria. And the French military commander, de Maurier, calculated that with Belgian and French assistance, they could knock Austria out of the war in 15 days. And the war would continue on for nearly 20 years. And almost immediately, the war began to go badly for France. Their attempts to ally with Prussia was rebuffed, and despite the wave of French nationalism, Frenchmen were not as eager to volunteer to fight the Austrians as the assembly had, had supposed. The French attempt to liberate Belgium, led by the patriot nobles Lafayette and Rochambeau, performed so badly against the Austrians that many in France suspected that the commanders were purposefully sabotaging the war. In the following month, a French invasion of Holland was also pushed back to the Austrians. And then Prussia declared war on France. The conservative delegates received news of the collapse of the French invasion with shock and horror. And with enemy armies now moving on to France, the assembly, as usual, blamed the war failure on sabotage by the emigre nobles, the Jacobin, or Austrian agents. And then on May 28th, a rumor started that a coup was being plotted against the assembly. And they began passing legislation to put down dissent and shore up the military defenses, particularly around Paris. However, the king used his veto prerogative to block several of these measures. And at this point, it became evident that no one in France now trusted the king. Mass demonstrations began to appear throughout Paris, protesting his vetoes and the dismissal of the patriot ministers around him. On June 20th, a massive armed protest assembled outside the legislative assembly. They entered the building and then proceeded to lecture the delegates about the king's unfaithfulness. Eventually, having satisfied themselves, they then marched through the building and along carnival procession to the palace. And it's not certain if they had any clear intentions to enter, but after speaking with the National Guard at the gates, they were allowed to proceed into the palace. Seeking out the king, they barged into his room where they then cornered him against a window and angrily demanded that he rescind his vetoes. And Louis calmly explained to them that this was not the time or place to discuss these matters, but agreed that he would do so at a later time. The mob proceeded then to passively, aggressively threaten Louis and his wife and son. And delegates at the assembly hearing what was going on over at the palace rushed over and managed to convince the mob to disperse. Now, the June 20th event appears to never have had any planned goal, and no real violence was ultimately committed. But the assembly and the nation were polarized over whether it had been an attempted coup or whether it was a justified, mostly peaceful protest. Lafayette, however, was outraged by the event, and he left his troops at the front, appeared before the assembly, and demanded that the government arrest the perpetrators as well as the entire Jacobin club, threatening the assembly with violence if they failed to act. He then approached the Parisian National Guard, whom he had once commanded, and tried to convince them to follow him in an attack on the Jacobin leaders. But at this point, Lafayette had now destroyed his revolutionary credentials, and the National Guard refused to follow him. He determined now to try to help the king escape from the palace. But Louis and Marie distrusted Lafayette as much as the rest of France and refused to believe that he was now acting against the assembly. Having failed as a military commander in the war, disgraced among his former revolutionaries and distrusted by his king, Lafayette returned north to his command. <laughs> 
victorious Prussian and Austrian armies now began advancing towards Paris. The assembly called on all able-bodied men to take up arms to protect the homeland, and they ordered 100,000 National Guard to the defense of Paris. With foreign armies now marching on the capital, and having seen a beloved military general revealed as a traitor to the nation, some of even the delegates then began to perceive the king as a threat to national security. Louis's position was further endangered when later that month, the Allied Prussian and Austrian armies issued a declaration that, quote, if the least violence, the least outrage be done to their majesties, our troops will take unforgettable vengeance on the city of Paris, unquote. But this message had the exact opposite intended effect. The people and government in Paris became only further determined that they must oppose by all means necessary the, quote, foreign horde spread like a destroying torrent over the countryside, unquote. Popular petitions were made to the assembly to indict Lafayette for treason and to discuss whether the king had legally abdicated. But even after all of this, the assembly gave Lafayette a vote of confidence and refused to debate the king's status. And this was met with widespread frustration and anger. And the legislative assembly now began to lose all credibility as well. Louis at this point was urged by multiple ministers and delegates to either flee the country or to abdicate. Um, but Louis was determined that he would remain in Paris as king, and he began to shore up the defenses around the palace, confident that he could hold out. Some of the more liberal members of the assembly had been hoping that if Louis could not be convinced to abdicate, then he could be forcibly evicted. But seeing the fortifications being strengthened and the 4,000 troops stationed at the palace, including nearly 1,000 Swiss guards, it suddenly dawned on them that they might not be able to remove the king from the palace even by force. And hopes for a peaceful government transition began to dwindle. And meanwhile, the rumor began circulating around Paris that with the city being threatened by the Allied armies, the king was planning to use his troops at the palace to take over Paris from within and massacre the inhabitants. And believing that the assembly had sold them out, the people of Paris now took matters into their own hands. During the night of the 9th of August, the Paris government, independently of the assembly, met in order to, quote, recommend immediate steps to save the state, unquote. By early morning, they determined that the best course of action was with the assistance of the National Guard in the city to march against the palace, peacefully convince the soldiers there to step aside and then to remove the king. Various armed contingents moved in orderly fashion to the palace gates where they entered into negotiations with the soldiers. The National Guard posted there, and even some of the Swiss Guard were eventually convinced to abandon the fortifications, at which point the king and queen determined to move to the assembly building for protection among the delegates. The remaining Swiss guard then pulled back into the interior of the palace, where they then fired on the revolutionaries attempting to negotiate down in the courtyard, and in a violent assault, they pushed the French out of the palace. All of Paris became engulfed in a panic as cries spread that the Swiss had without provocation begun a massacre. Military reinforcements joined the Parisians, and they managed to push the Swiss back into the palace. And when the Swiss guard ran out of ammunition, their retreat became a rout, and the angry French refused to take prisoners. And the people of Paris responded to the victory with a shock of relief. Completely uncertain of the outcome, they had believed that the fate of the city hung on their success that day. The king was led away from the assembly building to prison. The assembly delegates voted to suspend the monarchy and declared a constitutional convention. But the conservative delegates, either out of fear or protest, boycotted the assembly. And public opinion became further radicalized when Lafayette then deserted and attempted to flee to England, while at the same time a cache of incriminating royal communications was discovered in the palace, further condemning the king. France was astonished to discover that a second revolution had just been waged and won. But despite their surprise and uncertainty regarding what form of government they would pursue, it was immediately understood everywhere that Louis the Last, as one deputy called him, would not be returning to the throne. When the convention finally declared that the executive was going to be subsumed into the assembly and France would henceforth be a republic, the end of the monarchy was widely accepted with approval, but the general atmosphere was far more somber. One of the participants in the attack on the palace remarked 
whatever my political opinions and my support for the revolution, I had been raised under a monarchy, and its fall left me with a feeling of amazement, of pity, and of fear. The revolution of 1792, although successful like its 1789 predecessor, now faced a more partisan divide, a massive foreign invasion, and fear and distrust of counter-revolutionary sabotage and intrigue. And if you're familiar with the resulting French downturn into chaos, the eventual trial and execution of the king and queen for treason, the 1793 military draft rebellions in the Vendée, Federalist uprisings in the South, mass trials and executions specifically in Paris and Nantes, they all took place within this context of fear that French patriots were on the verge of facing as one royalist paper demanded the extermination of the revolutionary virus. So my, my goal this evening has not been to defend the revolution. The, the French Revolution did end up going down some very dark roads. But rather, as my title suggests, this has been a call for a rethinking of the French Revolution, and specifically a rethinking of the belief that as Burke claimed, the ideology of the revolutionaries in 1789 inevitably led to the terror of 1793. Uh, because this, this fails on two counts. Um, first, history is never inevitable. At many points throughout this narrative, we see where French history could have taken dramatically different turns and possibly remained a constitutional monarchy. The outcome of the revolution, in fact, even the revolution itself, was not the result of a grand plan. It was the result of events and circumstances, many of which were entirely outside of the revolutionaries' control. Again and again, we see the French delegates trying to save the phenomenon of the monarchy, despite the king, the nobles, and foreign princes undermining it every turn. And all of these contributed to and helped to create the French radicalization towards republicanism. And which brings me to my second point, that human motivation is not reducible to ideology. The fears and desires exhibited in the French Revolution are far more broadly human than conservatives give them credit for in the French Revolution, but they emerged due to the unique circumstances of their own time and place. And this means that comparing revolutions, especially to pass judgment on them, is, I think, of limited use. Right? If ideology is only one factor among many, it's not certain how to weigh these factors against each other, especially if they fluctuate. And the French Revolution most often gets contrasted with the American Revolution. But this fails to appreciate, as I discussed in the previous lecture, that while their ideology was not as dissimilar as is often portrayed, the circumstances and events between the two were dramatically different. So instead of contrasting the American and French revolutions, I think perhaps a better question of analysis would be to instead ask, to what extent would the American revolutionaries have acted differently had they been in Paris in 1789 or 1792? Or would they have acted similarly based on the same fears and terrors? And I think one reason why people find it convenient to focus on ideology is because if we're lazy about the history, it's easy to impute motives. And it also, it gives us the ability to sit comfortably in judgment on the past. Right? If we reduce everything to ideological determinism, then we can know that because of our right moral education, we're better. Right? We, and we, we would have done the right thing. It allows us to not have to see ourselves in the humanity of the past. We can safely advocate for the rise of a national strongman or a Christian prince or an American Franco because we have conservative politics and principles. But this is just a failure to appreciate our ability for self-deception and justification of evil in the name of self-preservation. As one delegate to the National Assembly wrote in 1793, few men are able to maintain their integrity when everything around them is threatening and shaking and collapsing. They are pushed along and carried away without ever realizing it. They are swept up in the passions of others. And when circumstances and human nature are stacked against us, we're all capable of becoming Saul's or David's or Solomon's. And those of us that think that we're safe, we're the ones most at risk.
I'm going to turn to an analogy of the Lord of the Rings. We do not fight Mordor by having the false confidence of Boromir. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this presentation from the George Buchanan Forum Conference. We have many more that you can check out at our website at tgbf.org. You can also find us on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting platform. In true free market fashion, we're entirely crowdfunded by the generous support of people like you. If you'd like to help our work, you can set up one-time or recurring donations at tgbf.org. The best way for others to hear about us is from their friends. So please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing our material. We greatly appreciate it.